So let me introduce our next uh, speaker. We're doing a World Series talk, and our speaker is very inspirational, is Fawn Sharp. She's the president of the Quinault Indian Nation, and she's on the leadership circle for the We Are Still Coalition. So I'll move that over to you, all right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, that's how we say good morning in my language, the Quinault uh, Indian Nation. On behalf of my tribe, I want to express the deep gratitude I have for this venue and this opportunity. I've been elected to five terms. I'm only the ninth president of the Quinault Nation since the last century. I'm the second woman president, and I have a challenge uh, in dealing with climate change. So I just want to briefly explain the challenges that my nation is going through at this very moment. When I got elected in 2006, uh, our scientists talked to, talked to me about the decline of our blueback sockeye salmon. We had millions of these beautiful, pristine fish flow through the Quinault River in the 1950s and 60s. The year I got elected, we only had 4,000 of these beautiful sockeye that only come to the Quinault. This last year, we harvested 27. And this year, we had to close that fishery that has been enjoyed by our people from when time began. Along with that, my first weekend in office, I got elected March 28, 2006. I started to try to figure out, how am I going to manage this reservation? We occupy 220,000 acres, 31 miles at international border. So I started checking out. You know, I went on Google. <laughs> I did a Yahoo search. Uh, best practices, managing forests, managing timber. And I learned about this thing called cap and trade, carbon sequestration. I learned that if we extend our rotation, we can have a pre-harvest revenue. If we harvest, we get that revenue. And if we produce green certified wood, there's a post-harvest revenue. Uh, and at the time, there was a, a voluntary system here in the United States, the Chicago Climate Exchange, one in California and one in New England. But domestic companies couldn't access those markets because the US is not a signatory to the Kyoto Protocol. Well, we did some research. Notwithstanding that fact, a tribal nation could engage in international trade and commerce, as long as it's not inconsistent with our domestic dependent status. So I found there's a point of entry and ways for tribal nations to stand on the long, long, uh, from when time began, standing to engage in international trade and commerce to attract investment that otherwise would never even see the shores of the United States. So I started to, to, to really look into this issue, and I was frustrated. No matter where I went in this country, whether it was in Olympia, whether it was Washington, D.C., I would raise the issue of climate change among all the different uh, politicians and venues within state, regional, and every time I'd mention climate change, the room would get quiet, and then someone would change the subject. And I could never have a decent, substantive policy discussion with anyone. So in 2009, we went outside the United States to the Conference of Parties, COP14, and that was right after President Obama was elected, but before he was sworn in. There was a great deal of hope and optimism that the United States would now come to the table and we would now negotiate. And I'll never forget that following April, a U.S. representative went to Bonn, Germany to basically announce to the world there's no political will in the United States. And at the time, uh, our, our climate impacts at Quinault started to heighten and increase to the point where I had to declare four states of emergency because of the rising ocean. We're having to relocate two of our villages right now to higher ground. The place where my ancestors signed a treaty is now underwater. I took a helicopter flight in the Olympic mountain range to see the glaciers that feed the mighty Quinault. I was fully expecting to see a beautiful blue sheen of glacier. When we came over the ridge, I saw nothing but dirt. I physically came face to face with a mountain to hopefully see the glacier that feeds and provides the cooling temperature, the right water flow for these prized sockeye to return completely gone. I cannot explain to you the feeling of coming face to face with a mountain where the glacier is, no longer exists. We have four glaciers. The one is uh, nearly receding, the White Glacier, and two others. 
I took a helicopter flight this last October and saw that the second one is rapidly receding as well. So what do we do? I try to advance legislation in Olympia. I was ap appointed to the Carbon Emission Reduction Task Force by Governor Inslee. Uh, we came up with some recommendations. None of them were adopted. We couldn't get traction anywhere in Olympia. I worked with Speaker Pelosi, then Speaker Pelosi, on uh, various bills over the last 15 years. None of that's getting any traction. Hopefully, this new effort will, will see some traction. So three years ago, we decided, let's take this out to the citizens. I firmly believe that the average citizen understands the impacts of climate change, and they're willing to do something about it. So we secured over 300,000 signatures, put an initiative on the ballot this last November. It was called I-1631. And lo and behold, the Western States Petroleum Association sunk $33 million into this campaign to kill it. Over 90% of those campaign contributions came from out-of-state fossil fuel industries who had no idea the policy that we envisioned was our vision for what's minimally necessary to effectively combat climate change. Minimally necessary. And I, I'm telling you, that the week after the election, I actually had to leave the country. I found this three-day cruise to Mexico. Uh, after, after a three-year campaign, I, I had to get out of the country and just get to a private space. I was able to relax some, uh, but when I came back home, I flew out of LAX and I flew over the Malibu fire. I flew over paradise. And once again, I felt the deep psychological impact of climate change. A land where I know that's been pristine, that was gifted to our ancestors when time began by our creator, our people who over the generations have learned to balance beauty, the sacred beauty and what Mother Earth provides to us to sustain us, completely going. And, and throughout the world, there are multiple reports. Indigenous peoples are the most impacted, and we've had the least to do with the problem. In fact, we are out there trying to solve these problems. We're securing a blueback restoration project, which is a cutting edge way of trying to restore our watershed in the Quinault to protect those, those prized blueback sockeye salmon. And I'm not re ready to concede to the fossil fuel industry. In fact, I'm at the point now, I want to make them wish 1631 would have passed. <laughs> and so my down moment was the morning I woke up when I returned home and I had to face my children and tell them that we lost 1631. I could almost not bear it to walk down the stairs to look them in the eyes and tell them. And I had tears and I asked rhetorically, kids, we try to go to Olympia, we try to go to DC, we tr try to take it to the citizens, what do we do now? I was just searching, what do we do now? And my little girl wiped her hair out of her eyes, through her tears, and she said, Mama, we keep fighting. We keep fighting. And my little guy said, and we don't stop. So we are about to roll out a six-point strategy I'll be introducing to the Quinault Council this next week. We intend to sue the fossil fuel industry. There's no secret. <laughs> ExxonMobil knew exactly what they were doing. 30 years ago when their board had those reports and when they mounted a public relations campaign to deny climate change, they knew exactly what they were doing. We also need to sue our trustee, the federal government that's supposed to look out when we signed those sacred treaties, who continue to roll back regulations, who continue to allow these large interests influence the public debate and policy. And I'm convinced there are politicians in the Democratic Party, there are politicians in the Republican Party, but there are leaders in those parties. There are leaders in corporations. There are leaders among the scientific community. There are leaders in the faith-based community. There are leaders in our children. There are leaders in the average citizen. And my closing remarks to you are to resist the temptation to become apathetic. Resist the temptation to delve into the political landscape that's on fire, to delve into bipartisanship, to delve into the negativity 
there's a burning landscape in this country, and it's not just the natural landscape, it's the political landscape. We are at a time where we are facing a global crisis of epic proportions. This is the time for us to rise above all that, for the leaders who feel deeply and passionately about this issue as much as, as we do at Quinault to come together. And my last bit of advice, this morning I took a run up to Telegraph Hill. Uh, I do that when I get excited, so that tells you I was excited to be here with you guys. Uh, but I watched the sunrise over the Bay Bridge, and I encourage you, it's, it's just about a mile, 1.2 miles, go for a quick brisk, a run. If you don't want to do that, catch an Uber. Um, but when you go up there and you connect with that be beautiful sky and you watch the sun come over the bay, it'll, it'll mark that point in, deep in your conscience about this moment in time. There's a powerful thing with connecting, not just connecting with each other, but connecting with our natural world. And look at that for just a moment and realize we have been in a dark era, but that sun is rising. We are seeing daylight. We are seeing that those clouds that represent darkness, full of poisons and gas, this is the low point. We are going to turn that around and raise that darkness and bring light to our society and our communities. Look out for seven generations like our ancestors have. So I just encourage each and every person in this room, be that leader that you've always known you've had from the time when you were a child, imagine those dreams that you had as a child and imagine the future generations and our young people that want to aspire to do those same things. So when you see Quinault, I want you to remember this. We are willing, tribal nations across this country, to engage. We have political standing, we have history, we have value, we have knowledge. And it's going to take all of us to come to the table. No one's immune from this crisis, and everyone has a role to contribute. So we are going to take up our lawsuits. We are going to continue to hold the fossil fuel accountable. Uh, we're looking at exercising a, a carbon fee, standing on our own uh, initiative. And those are things that I know is going to happen. And when you think about 10 years from now, I also want you to ask, what was it that you did in 2018 that you can say over the last decade, not only my effort, but this is how I engaged with others. This is how we led this, because time goes by oh so fast. But I firmly believe the answer to this global crisis lies within each one of us. The power of this country does not reside in one office, an Oval Office on Pennsylvania Avenue. It does not reside in Wall Street. The power of this country lies within each and every one of us. The voice that we have to come together as leaders among all the sectors. Our children are depending on us. They are looking at what we're doing. They're watching what we do. So be that person, be that leader that you've known you have deep within you, that your children can be proud of, that your grandchildren, that your colleagues. Because together, I firmly believe the answer lies within us. This is our finest hour. We are facing a global crisis of epic proportions, but it's not beyond us. We will accomplish all that we envision. Siokuel, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here.